Good morning, good morning. Hey, uh, if you don't have a Bible on the back, there should be some blue softback Bibles. It's our gift to you. Grab that, keep that, read that, live in that word. Uh, and I'm also told that we uh, ran out of bulletins on the way in. And so uh, if you don't have a bulletin, just go ahead and use that Connect card. Uh, take notes on the back of that. We will start printing more. Uh, if you can't tell, we're getting fuller and fuller every single week here at Story Church. And so we are praying, uh, as Nathan already shared, uh, for the Lord to provide us some avenues for uh, for generosity and uh, for, for uh, different gathering places with our kids and, and here. Not different location, just different creativity. And so would you pray? Pray alongside us. Join us Wednesday night at prayer night. Uh, we are going to pray about that. Psalm chapter 96. We're in a sermon series called Embark, uh, where we're pursuing life with God. And so we want to, as a church over this uh, school year, we want to continue to grow in our spiritual vitality and our spiritual maturity. And God has given us the spiritual disciplines as paths of grace that we put ourselves on in order to receive his mercy, receive his grace, and grow to look more like him. And so week one, we talked about the Bible, Bible intake, primary, right? And then we talked about prayer week two. This is the uh, inhale and exhale of the Christian faith. We inhale God's word and we exhale our prayers. And then this week, we're going to talk about worship. Naturally, worship flows out of the place of knowing God. Now, the current uh, world population rounding up is about 8 billion people. And there's something that all 8 billion people around the world share in common aside from a heartbeat, and that's that we're worshipers. Every single one of us are worshipers. Whether you're Christian, Jew, Muslim, or even an atheist, rich, poor, white, black, Native American, educated, uneducated, every single person is a worshiper. David Foster Wallace, in a commencement speech from 2005 that was turned into a book called This Is Water, says this. Here's something else that's weird but true. In the day-to-day trenches of adult life, there is actually no such thing as atheism. There is no such thing as not worshiping. Everybody worships. Here it is. The only choice we get is what to worship. We cannot help ourselves. God has hardwired it into our natures to be worshipers. There's a variety of things that we all worship, whether it be our favorite musicians or athletes, our favorite bands or sports teams, our accomplishments and our resumes. We worship our spouses and our children, our companies and our finances. In other parts of the world, they may worship ancient false tribal gods. Even other parts of the world, they may worship cows and fish and birds. Worship, again, is something that in of itself is not a negative. It is hardwired into our very DNA. Sin, though, came into the picture and frayed that hardwire, so to speak, and changed the direction of our worship, changed what we worship. This is called idolatry. And as John Calvin famously said, the human heart is an idol factory, always creating idols to worship, which is why worship is a spiritual discipline. Worship, hear me, is less about feel and emotion. It's not not those things. It's just less about those things and more about disciplining ourselves in the direction that our worship is going to flow. So what is worship? Is worship just the two songs on the front and the back end on Sunday mornings? Yes, it's absolutely that. And It's communion and baptism and prayer and community and how we view our relationships and how we view our work and how we view our neighborhoods and how we view our lives before God. Biblically speaking, in in Hebrew, the, the word from which we get worship can also be translated as bow down. Worship is what you bow down to. It can be physically and literally what you bow down to, or more than likely, it is spiritually what your heart bows down to, which is why there's a plethora of things that we can and do worship in this world. We bow down to our emotions. We bow down to our appetites. We bow down to our hobbies. We bow down to our finances. We bow down to our children. We bow down to our fear or our anxiety, our worry, or fill in the blank. 
And so the theme verse for this whole series is 1 Timothy 4, 7, where Paul commands Timothy to train in godliness, exercise yourself to become more like Jesus. And worship is a way in which we train ourselves to become more like Jesus through bowing down to God. So here's our working definition of worship. And this is, again, derived from Don Whitney's Spiritual Disciplines for the Christian Life. Worship is focusing on, responding to, and living for God. Focusing on, responding to, and living for God. Uh, Maybe a, a way to encapsulate that is to say, worship is being preoccupied with God. Whatever you're doing, in the back of your mind, you're thinking about, focusing on, moving your life towards God, not away from him. That's worship. So those three things is what we're going to walk through this morning. Worship as focusing on God, responding to God, and living for God. You with me? All right. Number one, worship. Worship is focusing on God. Now, you may or may not hate sports and baseball in particular, and you're probably tired of my baseball illustrations, but I'm going to do another one because it's all I got. Regardless of your interest in baseball, if you're teaching a new person, a young boy, let's say, to hit a baseball for the first time, whether or not you know baseball, you're going to give the same piece of advice every single time. What's the first piece of advice for someone learning to hit a baseball? Keep your eye on the ball. Everyone knows it. See, sports can work. Uh, They do work. Why is that the first piece of advice? You can't hit what you can't see. You simply cannot make contact with a ball if you're not looking at it. Similarly, you cannot worship what you do not know. Or said inversely, you do worship what you focus on. What you keep your heart's eye on is the thing you're going to naturally gravitate towards worshiping. And so we will worship God in an increasingly biblical and an increasingly pure way as we focus on him, as we know him. You remember week one when I was talking about the Bible, I said the Bible and Bible intake is the spiritual discipline that keeps us hemmed in from going wild and out with all the other ones. Why? Well, with worship, we have to worship the right God in the right way. If worship becomes this mystical, emotionally driven experience, we're likely not worshiping the God of the Bible because we aren't worshiping him in the way he has described himself and the way he has demanded us to. Think about this in all of your other relationships. The more I get to know Katie and I focus on Katie and her me and all of our quirks and all of our, she doesn't have imperfections and all of her... um, close to imperfections, uh, the more I love her, the more I get to know those things, the more I get to know my kids, the more I love them, the more I get to know you guys and you get to know me, the more we love each other. And as we get to know the God of the Bible, our hearts focus on him and we naturally respond to him with love, with an increased love. Look back at the psalm with me. We're going to run through the whole thing. And I want you just to see how focused this psalm of worship is on God, not on humans, not on creation, not, not on anything other than God. Look back at the psalm with me, the whole thing. Listen for the emphasis. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord. Bless his name. Tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations. His marvelous works among all peoples. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the people are worthless idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty in his sanctuary. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the people. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. Tremble before him 
all the earth. Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. Yes, the world is established. It shall never be moved. He will judge the peoples with equity. Let the heavens be glad and let the earth rejoice. Let the sea roar and all that fills it. Let the field exult and everything in it. Then shall all the trees of the forest sing for joy before the Lord. For he comes. For he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the people in his faithfulness. By my count, that's 26 references to God in 13 verses. That's two times. I mean, I can do math. That's basic. Two times per verse, God is being mentioned. This is a focus on our triune God in our worship. Why though? Why is the psalmist so focused on the Lord? Why is the psalmist drawing our attention to take our gaze off of ourselves and fix it on him? Why? Well, look at the ways in which he describes the Lord He says, sing to the Lord a new song, sing to the Lord, bless his name. Why? Tell of his salvation. He is rehearsing the salvation that God has granted to his people, that once we were bound to sin and Satan, but Jesus put sin and Satan to death and conquered them, and because of that, we now sing to God. He says, declare his glory among the nation, his marvelous works. It's it's more than just his work of salvation. It's his daily work that this psalmist is rehearsing, that every single day without fail, our God cares for us and he's near to us and he protects us and he satisfies us and he provides for us. He is the one who does the marvelous works in our lives that we all too often take for granted. He talks about the worthlessness of idols in verse five. And then he immediately compares that to God creating the heavens. He is creating this distinction between idols and God, that idols will promise to you what only God can give to you. Idols cannot create, did not create, do not have the power to create. They are essentially worthless, but our God spoke a single word and everything came out of nothing. That's the amount of power that God has in a word. And if you're needy and you go to him, it takes but a word from his mouth for everything to change. We worship him because of his power. Splendor and majesty. Rick, I'm glad you're back, buddy. I needed that. (laughs) Splendor and majesty, these are royal terms. He is king of kings and lord of lords. He is the one to be bowed down to. He is altogether different than every king of the Bible and every king we know in our world, where kings throughout history subjugate their people and steal from their people and require their people to do things for them. He, as our king, does not subjugate us, but he frees us. He doesn't take from us, but he gives to us. And what he requires from us, he gives us through the finished work of Jesus Christ. He talks about, on repeat, God's strength. Is God's power limited to help? Is God's arm too short to save? Is anything too hard for our God? No, he is strong and able and he is willing. He talks about the beauty of God. To focus on the Lord is to fix your eyes on the most stunning thing you could ever imagine. Whether you're driving through the Sierra Nevadas, you're sitting amongst the redwoods, you're at the banks of the Pacific Ocean, you are seeing beauty that is just a fraction of the beauty of our God. I mean, we've seen some of the sunrises and sunsets over the last couple of weeks, right? I mean, that's just a fraction of the beauty of who our God is and what our God has done. He talks about God's glory and holiness, his perfection, his righteousness, his faithfulness, how he judges with equity. In other words, our God is perfect, and everything he does is perfect, and he grants you his perfection through Jesus and draws near to you through Jesus, and we get to experience the perfect as imperfect people, and when we do experience him, it naturally leads to worship. And so the psalmist is saying, focus your eyes, not on yourself, not on your circumstances, not on the people around you, not on your sin, focus your eyes on the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And when you do, 
To borrow from another Psalm, Psalm 34, eight, you will taste and see that the Lord is good. That's the promise of the scriptures, that if you look to God and you pursue God and you draw near to God and you make yourself available to God, you will taste and see, you will experience and know that God is good and great and glorious and he is to be highly praised. We worship what we focus on and we focus on what we worship. This is why John chapter four commands us to worship God in both spirit and in truth. God draws us to himself and he is spirit and his spirit dwells within us, bridging that divide so we can worship him, but we are to worship him in truth where we know who he is and what he demands from us and how he knows us in the word and we worship him in that way. So we must focus on God as worship. How? How do we do that? I mean, it's week one and two of this, word and prayer. I'm just gonna keep coming back to that over the next couple of months. Every single time we're talking about how we do things, how do we worship God, how do we focus on God, word and prayer. God, reveal yourself to me in your word that I might know you and I might know you in increasing ways and I might mo- know you more truly. And as I know you more truly, I'm gonna come to you in prayer to be acquainted with you and familiar with you and in your presence, know your power, know your peace, know everything you offer to me. I'm I'm gonna draw near to you, God, in word and prayer, for you have drawn near to me through the Spirit. So first, worship is focusing on God, keeping our eye on the ball, so to speak. Number two, respond to God. When you begin to know God through focusing on him, that's where it leads to our response. Now, when I'm talking about responding to God, this is probably the primary category where all of us consider worship. It's not the starting place, though. You must start by knowing God and worshiping him as he demands. Then, from knowing God, you worship him. How do we respond to God? Well, you can see in your Bibles, Psalm 96 is broken up into four paragraphs. Uh, and, And that's four different ways in which we respond to God. In verses one through six, we sing to the Lord. In verses seven through nine, we ascribe to the Lord. In verse 10, we say about the Lord and to the Lord. And verses 11 through 13, we celebrate. The four responses the psalmist describes, and this is not exhaustive, is singing, ascribing, saying, and celebrating. So I'm gonna walk through each of those for us. In verses, again, one through six, we are told that singing is a response to our focus on the Lord. Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name. Your singing, friends, is an act of worship and of warfare. It is an act of worship in that you are declaring, God, my heart is in love with you and you alone, and where it's not, I I want it to be. Loosen my grip on sin and my affections on the things of this earth and help me to worship you and you alone, God. And then it's warfare, where you are declaring war on those worthless idols that we naturally go and worship to. God, I'm not gonna worship and sing to those things. I'm gonna sing to you and you alone. Your singing is both worship and warfare. And one of my favorite characteristics about our church, and there are many, is that we are a singing people. I love it. One of my favorite things to do, uh, particularly uh, when we do the doxology a cappella, is to just stop singing and listen to a couple hundred voices in this room sing together. I mean, it's just one of the most beautiful sounds to my ears. It encourages my faith. It strengthens my resolve to worship and follow Jesus. I love hearing our voices lifted high as a congregation. And it is an act as a church of worship and warfare where God is growing us and he is drawing us into his presence. What, though, are the lyrics of our songs What are the lyrics of our songs? Because all too often, I hear a lot of worship songs that are not at all about God and all about us, right? Well, the psalmist gives us a little bit of direction here. He says, sing to the Lord a new song. Does this mean we need to come up with new songs every single day? I'm not a poet or a lyricist. There's probably not many in this room. If you wanna do that, 
I'd love that. I'd love to hear a song you wrote. Um, But what he's talking about there is that as God's people, we are delivered from the power of sin and the penalty of sin, but we're not yet delivered from the presence of sin. And so we are still fallen people who every single day sin and fall short of the glory of God. But what does Lamentations 3 tell us? Every single day, though we sin, we also wake up to new morning mercies. God has mercies and grace that far surpass any daily sin I can commit. And when I come to God and I say, forgive me afresh, wash me clean, he does that. And naturally, another fresh song bursts from my soul because I experienced anew the the mercy of God. He says, sing to the Lord and tell of his salvation. Our songs are singing about his deliverance. If you want to see a, a song about that, go to Exodus 15. The people of God were just delivered from Egypt and they crossed the Red Sea and immediately after the the, the seas swallow up Pharaoh and the Egyptian armies, Moses and the people of God are singing songs of deliverance. Our songs should be all about thanking God that he would pick wretched sinners like you and I and make us new and clean and members of his kingdom. We tell of his salvation. We sing of his marvelous works, his provision and protection, his satisfaction and joy, his peace that surpasses all understanding, that he does exceedingly and abundantly far beyond anything we can ask or imagine, that whether or not we pray and ask for things, he is a good God who does good works towards us. We sing of that. We sing of his greatness is what verse four says, sing for the Lord is greatly to be praised. His greatness is about his otherness. He is separate from us, different than us, transcendent and eternal and infinite and all powerful. And we are totally dependent upon him in our lives. And we sing to him and ask for him to be near to us. We sing to him because he is not worthless, but as verse five says, he made the heavens. He is the creator God. We sing to him because he is full of splendor and majesty and strength and glory. We sing to the Lord about the Lord and we praise the Lord for his works in our lives. Next, in verses seven through nine, he says, ascribe to the Lord O families of the people, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. To ascribe to something is to attribute something to that thing. And worship is about God's worth or worthiness. So in ascribing to the Lord, we are attributing to God his worth, his worthiness. We are attributing it, ascribing it to him. But here's the deal, friends. We are a glory-hungry and a glory-starved people We are created with with little holes in our heart that we want to fill with glory and we thieve God of the glory due his name and we call things of this earth glorious. I mean, you've been there with me. That Taylor Swift concert was glorious. That overtime win was glorious. That vacation was glorious. Consummating the marriage was glorious. The steak dinner was glorious. We take things that are due only God's name and we ascribe the glory that is due him and we give it to those things, the things of this earth. Now now don't hear me saying that those things are bad things. Those are good things that are meant to point us to the heart of God. God's heart for us to give us good music that Taylor Swift produces and good steaks. Nothing past medium rare, okay? Amen. Amen. That that, that gets the response. (laughs) I'm telling you, God's glorious, and you're like, oh, okay. And then I say, steak, medium, rare. (laughs) Yes. When we experience those things, here's what we do with that. God, thank you for music. It is so beautiful. And that came from your heart and you wanted me to experience your heart through that. God, thank you for that steak. You created flavor and you gave us chefs that can put those things in cows and someone who butchered it for the first time. Who came up with that idea? 
But it's amazing. Thank you, God, for that. Thank you for marriage that I can know and be known, love and be loved fully and without regard. God, thank you that you created this earth and you've given us the ability to travel and see this earth and experience all of it. Everything, when we experience slivers of God's glory here on earth, it rolls up into God praise you for your name. I want to attribute to you worthiness because you made that and you did that. We say to the Lord, say among the nations, verse 10 says, the Lord reigns. The world is established, it shall never be moved. He will judge the peoples with equity. What are we saying in our worship? Christ is the Lord, Christ is King. Christ is the ruler of the universe, the Lord reigns. That's what we are saying, and that's what we must consistently say in our worship. Now, why, why do we keep saying that? Because the tendency for all of us in this room is to put ourselves squarely on the throne where God belongs. We want to say, God, get off that throne. I'm going to go ahead and get on there. I'm the God of my life. Everything orbits around me. I'm king of kings. I'm Lord of lords. That's worshiping ourselves and we need to take ourselves off the throne and say, God, I'm gonna bend knee and confess with my tongue that you are king and you are Lord and you're not an evil king or dictator. You are a good king who is near to us and compassionate. We proclaim every single day with our hearts and our tongues that Christ is Lord. He is ruler, he reigns supreme. The Bible's really clear, friends, that there is power in our tongues, the power to build up or tear down. And I want to build up the Lord, bless his name, is what verse two says. I wanna build him up. I wanna build myself up with the power of the tongue by proclaiming what is true about God, most prominently that he is king and I worship him. This is why in the Cunningham home, when we're doing family worship, the two things we, we try, like mostly unsuccessfully, but we try, and we're gonna keep trying, is scripture, memory, and catechism. Those are the two things. We want our kids to say constantly what is true about God, what is true about God. Remember it, get it in their hearts, get it in their bones, and say it out loud. We want them to remember who God is, speaking things out loud that are true about God. Say to the Lord. Finally, we respond to God through celebrating him. Look at verses 11 through 13 with me. Let the heavens be glad and let the earth rejoice. Let the sea roar and all that fills it. Let the field exult and everything in it. Then shall all the trees of the forest sing for joy before the Lord, for he comes, for he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples in his faithfulness. This psalm is almost like a tidal wave. It's just building and building and building, celebrating God's salvation and his works and his presence and his goodness and saying things that are true about him. And then the tidal wave just crashes and erupts in rejoicing, in exultation, in singing, in joy. And, and it's not contained just to you and I. The heavens and the earth, the sea and the field, everything in all of creation is singing the praises of our creator God. Joy and exultation, gladness and singing because of who God is and what God has done. Most prominently, the psalmist is rehearsing God God's judgment in righteousness and his faithfulness to his people. What he's just pointing back to there is the gospel of Jesus Christ, that before Jesus, we were judged as guilty and condemned and separate from God, but through the finished work of Jesus, we are now innocent and cleansed and perfect and adopted into the family of God, and God will judge us with equity, which means when he looks at you and I, he doesn't see us, he sees the work of Jesus Christ so long as our faith is in him. And then we look forward to his faithfulness, which is pointing to Jesus's return, where he's going to remake all things, bring his kingdom to earth, and we're going to rule and reign with him forever in the new creation. That's what we are celebrating about God. So respond to the Lord through singing to him, ascribing to him, saying about him, and celebrating him. And as I said, week one, every spiritual discipline has an individual and a corporate component to it. 
And worship is no different. There is a private and a public aspect of our worship where we are worshiping the Lord privately and publicly. But I wanna ask the question before we move on, what do I do when my heart is far from him? What do I do when I read Psalm 96 and I say, that's not me? I don't see myself in this song. I don't see myself celebrating God in that way. I don't see myself enjoying his wondrous works to me. What do I do with that? And I'm there all too often. And I know if you're honest, you are too. The things of life get in the way of us enjoying God. What do I do? Hebrews 10, 24 and 25 tells us, don't neglect this gathering as the day draws near and all the more we're gonna see God. So so what's what's that text teaching us? It is teaching us the truth that most often our spiritual disciplines are duty until they break through into delight. Here's what I mean by that. When my heart is far from God and I don't see myself in Psalm 96, that doesn't mean I give up, retreat, hide out, and come back in two years when I feel better about myself. It means that I press in and keep going and keep trying and keep singing and keep saying and keep rehearsing and keep drawing my heart in. And then eventually as I press in and I press in and I press in, God's spirit's gonna break through in our lives and our duty's gonna change into delight and then my heart's gonna look like Psalm 96. So when my heart is far from God, when your heart is far from God, church, I want to encourage you, don't give up. God is not far from you. God is not silent. He has not forsaken you. He is not unfaithful to you. He is unwaveringly committed to you and to your good. His spirit lives within you to prove that. Keep drawing near and he will break through. Final thing here, living for God. Now, our worship, as I already said, is never meant to be contained to us or contained to our homes, our cars, our couches, our living rooms, or this gathering. Our worship is meant to spill out into all of life. Look back at the text again with me and see just how missional this worship is. Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord. Bless his name. Tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory where? among the nations. His marvelous works among who? All peoples. Jump down to verse nine. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. Tremble before him, who? All the earth. Verse 10, say among the nations. The heavens and earth be glad. He will judge the world in righteousness, verse 13 says. There is a missional, an outward component to our worship. Now, when I was uh, at Western Seminary in Portland, Oregon, I was hired to be an intern at a local church there, um, just south of Portland, and I shared an office with a guy by the name of Rich Hebert. Rich was, I'm gonna guess, 75 years old, old, older, um, and... Uh, <laughs> my bad. Rick, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> Rich was getting ready to retire. He'd been in the pastorate for 40 some odd years and, uh, and he was an associate pastor at this point. He was part-time and he was phasing out over time. And uh, one day we were sitting in our office at our desks, just doing our own thing. And he goes, hey kid. And that's what he called me every time. And I'm convinced that's because he didn't know my name. But <laughs> hey kid, I wanna make you a deal. Which if you know me, the, like, there's no better sentence you could say to me. Let's make a deal. So let's make a deal. I'm in. I don't know what it is, but I'm in, Rick, Rich. And uh, he goes, I don't need these things anymore. Points to the books on his bookshelf. I'm phasing out. We're downsizing. We're going to move out of state. I'm going to give you all of my books. I'm like, sure, books are expensive. I'm in. And he goes, but here's the hook. You have to read a book with me first before I give you all of these books. Okay, what is it? And he introduced me to a book written in 1993 by John Piper called Let the Nations Be Glad. And there is a, a, a paragraph, and this is not overstating it, a paragraph in that book that changed the course of my life and ministry. I wanna read it for you. John Piper says this. Missions is not the ultimate goal of the church. Worship is. Missions exist because worship doesn't. Worship is ultimate, not missions, because God is ultimate, not man. 
When this age is over and the countless millions of the redeemed fall on their faces before the throne of God, missions will be no more. Worship, therefore, is the fuel and goal of missions. It's the goal of missions because missions, because in missions we simply aim to bring the nations into white-hot enjoyment of God's glory. When I'm talking about worshiping God as living for God, that's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about living on mission, doing evangelism, discipling others through your worship where you are enjoying God and you can't help but have it spill over into your workplace, into your neighborhood, with your friends, with your kids' parents, their their friends' parents and all other people where you are so enjoying God through worship that people see a contagious hope and joy in you and they want it for themselves. You see, we're gonna talk about evangelism next week as our spiritual discipline. Don't bail, it's gonna be awesome. And, and it's gonna be intimately connected to this idea that evangelism is less about going and being Ray Comfort, which is not bad, and more about you being someone who worships God with all of life. 1 Corinthians 10 tells us that whether we eat or drink, whatever we do, we do it to the glory of God. Everything you are doing is meant to be for the glory of God. So it changes the way you view your vocation. Whatever you do, stay-at-home moms, firefighters, accountants, police officers, and everyone in between, your job, your vocation is meant to be about the glory of God. As you live in your neighborhood, it's about the glory of God. As you befriend people, it's about the glory of God. As you give generously, it's about the glory of God. Everything, friends, is about your worship of God just bursting forth from you and spilling out all over people around you. Worship Worship is ultimate, not missions, because God is ultimate, not man. We worship him and we live for him. We'll talk more about that next week. Worship, then, is focusing in on responding to and living for God. So each week, uh, if you're new uh, around here, I've been giving just a big challenge for us to pursue corporately together. So week one, I said, hey, for 15 minutes a day, every day, read Romans 8 on repeat, just Print it out and read and reread and reread. Week two, I, I promoted the prayer night. So we're gonna gather Wednesday night for about an hour. We're gonna get after the Lord in prayer. I want you to be there. This week, worship, there's a lot less application to do with worship. But I wanna, I wanna attempt it anyways. And I know this one's gonna be challenging, but I wanna call it the Spotify challenge, okay? Here's what I want you to do. Every time there's an impulse in your heart to listen to music, listen to a podcast, throw the headphones in, whether you're just you know, working and you got some background noise, you're driving, you're on a walk with your kids or whatever you're doing, I want you to seize that moment and fill your heart and mind for one week, okay? One week with, with music that is about God, focused on God, draws your heart into God's heart, helps you respond to him properly, helps you to live for him. And so I I put together maybe four or five different ways uh, that you can do that, some playlists and and suggested uh, folks to listen to. So number one, self-serving here, uh, Story Church Worship Playlist. I mean, that's like 100 songs long at this point. It's different songs we'll sing on Sunday mornings. Um, uh, City of Light is awesome. I would listen to them, Shane and Shane. They cover everything. They're incredible. They have all kinds of hymns and modern music, the worship initiative. Uh, If you're into more hip hop, Beautiful Eulogy is great. And and anyone who's on the Humble Beast records is very good. Uh, And then King's Kaleidoscope, uh, one of my personal favorites. I love listening to them. That's just a a smattering. There's more. I I wanna encourage you and... and, uh, Maybe just to be a little bit controversial here, don't do like K-Love or anything like that. Do Spotify. The commercials are bad. I mean, and the, the hosts are, the MCs are worse. And uh, I'm, I'm not trying to be mean or anything. I'm just trying to say like, fill your minds with this, with what's true so you can focus on God, respond to him, and live for him. So one week, every time you feel that impulse coming, press into the Spotify playlist Let's focus on the Lord corporately. Come back next week ready to sing. Go ahead and pray with me. Father, we love you. And we do thank you for Jesus, his finished work on the cross in our place. That we can know you through him. 
We can focus on you because Jesus made that possible. We can respond to you rightly because our hearts are made new through him. And we can live for you because your spirit dwells within us, encouraging us and empowering us to live for you in all of life. And so God, help us to be a church who worships, not just here on Sundays, but in every place, in every way, throughout the day, wherever we find ourselves, would we worship you, know you, focus on you, respond to you, and sing to you. Lord, thank you that you've made yourself available to us. Thank you that we can know you at all. Thank you that you're present among us. And I ask, uh, as we close out this service this morning, God, that you would be present with us in your power in unique and tangible ways today. Pray all this in the name of Jesus, amen.